Mr. President. Senator from Alabama is recognized. I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, um, the Reed Substitute S3525, uh, the Sportsman Act of 2012, is legislation that has a lot of very good things in it. And, and Senator Reed attempted, uh, although outside the normal committee process, to put together a package of bills that uh, could do some good things. And, I generally am supportive of the package. I uh, think it has some very good qualities to it. In fact, I very much want to support it. But there's a problem with it. It's a small problem, but an important problem, and it needs to be fixed. And that is that once again, after the Budget Control Act agreement that we reached August a year ago, 15 months ago, uh, the majority has brought forth a bill that violates the Budget Act, the Budget Control Act, really, uh, in which the deemed numbers for the budget were uh, part of that process. Uh, and it, we spend more than we agreed to spend just 15 months ago. And 15 months ago, we agreed to limit spending each year for the next 10 years and to stay within a a limited amount of spending because we're borrowing virtually 40% of every dollar we spend. This country has a debt crisis staring us in the eye. Without any doubt, the most obvious threat to America's future is the surging debt. Four trillion dollars plus increased debt in just four years and the end is not in sight. So we agreed, as part of raising the debt ceiling, to limit spending. And this bill violates that. And we need not to do that. It's not the first one. It's about the fourth one. And that irresponsibility is one of the things that placed us into this fix. And we looked the American people in the eye uh, 15 months ago and said, okay, we'll raise the debt ceiling uh, $2.1 trillion dollars because the administration had reached the limit of borrowing the United States can occur. And, but we said we would cut over 10 years, we would reduce our projected spending increases over 10 years by $2.1 trillion. And, we'd, and part of the act was the Budget Control Act that limited on spending in various accounts, and this one violates it. You say, well, Jeff, that's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. I raise this with Chairman Conrad, our chairman of the budget committee, on which I'm ranking member, and he and his staff have looked at it, and they've certified that this budget violation actually occurs. Therefore, the legislation is subject to a budget point of order. It cannot go forward because it violates the budget. Now, if that's raised and at some point I, I guess I would expect to do that. Uh, if we raise this budget point of order, which w will, be, will happen, then uh, my colleagues will have a choice. They can either fix the uh, difficulty with the budget and, and, and place the bill on a sound financial path, or they can say, well, we don't pay any attention to that objection. We'll waive the budget and just spend more than the budget allowed because this is really important. It's really important in effect that we uh, raise uh, revenue and spend more uh, on uh, the duck program, which I've been supportive of and the duck stamps fund and, and, and that kind of thing. So, but it, it's not the right way to do this. And if you're going to spend more money, you need to reduce the spending somewhere else. And your net by line should, should uh, be there. Also, I want to I'll point out that the legislation was changed from the time it came out of committee. Part of the legislation, at least, came out of the committee of which I'm a member, Environment and Public Works. And we observed that the proposal was to give 
bureaucrats, government officials, unelected, the power to meet with special interest or whoever they chose to meet with or not meet with and set the amount of fees, uh, taxes perhaps you might call it, uh, that would be required of Americans before they could hunt ducks. That's never been so. Previously, the Congress set how much you could charge for a duck stamp. And, and, and so this was raised in committee, and um, our able chairman, uh, chairwoman, uh, uh, Senator Barbara Boxer, agreed, and uh, I guess by a voice vote, it was accepted that, uh, uh, that there would be a limit on how much, uh, that Congress would set the limit on how much uh, you could raise a duck stamp and burden duck hunters with. And that's an important principle, in my opinion. That was, that's violated by the bill that was brought up, not the one that passed committee, but the one uh, brought up by the leader. So I, I got to say, I, I, you know, I grew up in the country. I hunted, and I don't hunt anymore. I go back home and love to be in the woods, but I just don't hunt anymore. But uh, I've been a big supporter, and so many of my friends are, are hunters and fishermen and, and they conservationists, and I, I really enjoy working with that. So it's sad that we're, not, we're having a dispute over this legislation because we're so close to being able to work out the problems. And my request would be, to Senator Reid and, and to our, our colleagues is let's fix this. Now it looks like the bill won't be brought up until Monday when we come back and there'll be ample opportunity for us to fix this problem so we don't, we're not passing a bill that violates the budget. Under the bill it would authorize and direct uh, $140 million in new spending over the next 10 years. 140 million. Now, some may say that's not a lot, but if that's so, they've been in Washington too long. 140 million dollars is a lot of money, and it's a very important principle because this isn't the first time we violated the Budget Act either. If we will stay with our agreement that we made with each other, that we made with the American people August a year ago, when the Budget Control Act was agreed to, we will have at least saved $2.1 trillion over 10 years. But if we keep nibbling away at it and eroding just what we agreed to, we not only undermine our own credibility, but we weaken our ability uh, to uh, balance the budget. And if we reach a new agreement, which we need to as we deal with the fiscal cliff, uh, don't the American people need to know that we'll stand by the agreement that we make? Don't they need to know that an agreement is something more than a, a momentary event to get past a crisis and that surely next year we can just ignore it? And, and uh, the next year we'll never stick to this? That's too much of that attitude in this Congress. That's one reason this country is in such deep financial uh, condition. Um, uh, so the Reed, Reed Amendment would violate those spending allocations um, and uh, will do it not only next year, but every year over the next 10 years. And it does not need to happen. Um, so you say, well, this is technical. It's technical because um, it's paid for. Well, we raise the revenue and we spend the revenue, uh, but the new spending is paid for by a revenue tax increase on the duck stamp. And therefore, what you're worried about, Sessions? Well, what are we worried about? The agreement was that this whole area of spending would be capped at a certain level. And the way to do this thing, if you're going to spend more uh, on the duck program, then reductions ought to be made somewhere else in this vast spending program. Else, you've taxed and spend. That's what we're doing. It's just a tax and spend. They say, uh, well, we can't cut anything else in the uh, 
uh, budget and, and dealing with the interior environment and those issues. There's no way we can save another uh, dime. We can't save $14 million a year anywhere. Of course we can. There's plenty of places to save it there and in any other one of the items that are out here in, in, in this government that waste money. But what do they really say? What they're saying is that of all the money we're currently being spending, we're spending, none, uh, all of that is more important than finding $14 million to spend on more duck reserves and programs. I'm not sure that's correct. I'm, a, I'm pretty much of a believer in a duck program, and I would like to see if we can't figure out a way to uh, do more to make sure that we preserve those flyways and, and, and the duck population in America. And I'm prepared to be a pretty aggressive as a member of the Senate in developing policies that do that. But you don't have to tax and spend more. That's the point. So if you look at it, they say, we can't cut any other spending in the entire federal government to find $14 million uh, for the duck program. So I would just say to my colleagues, that's what we are paid to do. We are paid to make those tough choices. And I, I, I don't like to sometimes, but it really shouldn't be very hard in this instance to find this kind of payment. And the idea that we can just up a fee and spend more money and violate the budget and nothing's going to happen and we're going to just go along and do that without objection is over because we're in a debt crisis. We've run up trillion plus deficits for the last four years. President Bush's last deficit was huge. It was one of the largest we'd have had in maybe ever, $470 billion. We've averaged about $1,100 billion the last four years. The year before he left office, it was a $160 billion deficit. So we've got $160, $470, a trillion plus, four consecutive years. We're on road in just a few years to double the debt of the United States again. And this cannot be sustained. That's all I'm saying. And we've violated, we've had the similar problems on the postal reform bill, the highway bill, and the veterans jobs bill. We've had problems with this spending violations on those bills too. So I really hope that we'll use this period of time in which we can, we can work out uh, some language to fix this problem. Uh, my budget staff, it can provide a long list of things that could be, that would save this much money but have no real impact on the productivity of our government. Um, the Migratory Bird Habitat Investment and Enhancement Act, that's a good name, sounds like something we should be for, which would give the Interior Department, uh, actually would give the Interior Department a blank check to increase the price of the duck stamp. Gives the Interior Department, unelected bureaucrats, the power to set how much we pay. Currently it's $15. They could do it to whatever figure the secretary would decide it should be without any limit whatsoever. And we discussed this in committee. And the committee said, no, this is not the way we want to go. We didn't do this before. We've not done this before. Congress has stepped up to the plate and been responsible and decided how much we're going to extract from the American people before we allow them to go duck hunting. It's a significant change from what the committee voted on. The duck is, stamp is purchased by all duck hunters in the United States. It was established in 1934, and since its beginning, it's always been set by Congress, not somebody in the bureaucracy. So I, don't, I think this is an unchecked power. I think it's a delegation of power to a person not accountable to the people, and it might violate the Constitution. Because only Congress can 
uh, appropriate money and, and raise taxes. Uh, and if it doesn't violate the Constitution explicitly, it violates the spirit of the Constitution. And uh, moreover, by increasing the price of duck, duck stamps, uh, if you think about it, in this amendment, um, it's an amendment, a revenue-raising amendment to an S-numbered bill. Senator Reid, uh, therefore, by doing that, has uh, and put a revenue enhancement bill uh, originating in the Senate, and the Constitution says revenue bills have to be uh, uh, originated in the House. So that's an important thing that uh, really places the bill in jeopardy because the House is very jealous, rightly so, of their constitutional prerogative of, of commencing all tax revenue bill, bills in the House. The Congressional Budget Office, our objective uh, analysis team, scores the duck stamp provision as an increase in revenue. If the House exerted its privilege under the Constitution, it would be subject to a blue slip, a rejection um, based on uh, the revenue clause. Um, so I think the, also, amazingly, we have about 19 bills, but we don't have amendments. No amendment process to even bring up amendments to vote. So we're stuck with a position of either supporting the bill as is in all its complexities, um, and if we fix this matter, I'd be supportive of the bill. We've tried to study it. I think it's okay and pretty good, actually. And it's a positive step in the right direction if we simply fix this. So the proper remedy... Uh, for this situation uh, is to allow amendments or send the bill back to committee and figure out how to pass the legislation that's within the uh, uh, budget limit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, President, I, I won't mention the uh, uh, all the good things about this bill. Uh, there's a lot of them. The, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Act and North American Wetlands Conservation uh, has good, some good provisions in it. A number of the other pieces of legislation are excellent. Um, uh, and um, so that I don't think is in dispute. Uh, supported by a lot of great wildlife organizations. And so I, I, I support that. But on September 22nd, uh, the Senate voted 84 to 7 to invoke cloture on the motion to proceed uh, with the full expectation uh, when the Senate returned this month that an opportunity would be provided to address the budget concerns and to improve the bill. Uh, but uh, now we see that our my friend, the majority leader, has decided to move forward without uh, confronting these issues or uh, doing it. So, Mr. President, I, I, I just hope we can figure out a way to avoid this con uh, situation. Uh, maybe people didn't think about it clearly. Maybe they just thought, well, it's paid for, therefore it can't be a problem with the budget. But even though it's paid for, it really is a problem with the budget. And we don't need to delegate to some unelected official, even if it is constitutional, which I have doubts, the ability without limit to raise fees for a normal historical right of Americans to go hunting ducks. So I just think that's got to be fixed too, and we should do that. And finally, I understand now we're about to reset, recess for the day all next week. In Armed Services Committee yesterday, we were told, well, we can get the Armed Services Authorization Bill, the Defense Authorization Bill, up for a vote. We can actually bring it up, and we can have a vote, and this is great news, and we have to do it in three days and very limited amendments, but if you Republicans would agree to that, we can get the bill up. Well, the, this is the first time in 50 years we've not passed the defense bill prior to the October 
September re, uh, fiscal year ended. We're already into the fiscal year. It should have been passed long ago. More than that, we could have spent three weeks on the defense bill. We did nothing in September. We're doing nothing next week. What is this about? It's about management of the Senate defeating the historic ability of members of the Senate to actually participate in the great issues of our time. One of them is the Defense Department budget and policy. It sets defense policy. And it came out of the Armed Services Committee unanimously. But a lot, several of us in committee said, we've got amendments we want to bring up on the floor. Other members not on the Armed Services Committee have a right to talk about this 540-some-odd billion dollar expenditure, the la largest single expenditure outside of Social Security and Medicare in the entire budget. So we're, now we're, going, we're, we're supposed to be thankful that we did nothing in September, going to do nothing next week, uh, but uh, you only now have three days and just a very few amendments which Senator Reid will pick and choose which ones you Republicans get to offer. And that's why we're having problems here. Senator Reid continues to assert that Republicans are filibustering. What Republicans are saying is, we're prepared to move to these bills, but we'd like you, leader, to tell us how many amendments we can get. He's figured out a way to fill the tree, uh, what we call the amendment tree, to a degree that's never been uh, done before. And uh, that allows him to pass legislation without any amendment. And so we said, well, we'd like to have amendments, Mr. Leader. This is the United States Senate. Okay, uh, submit me a list of them. You can have two. And it can't be this amendment. It can't be this amendment. It can't be this amendment. It can only be these kind of amendments. We'll, we'll be nice to you. Well, maybe three. Okay, you get three. On a $500 billion defense bill that sets a policy for our military, that decides on what weapons system we're going to invest in at, at our billions of dollars. And some people in this Senate have opinions about it. They want to come down to the floor. Maybe they campaign and they said, I'm against such and such in the defense bill. And they want to come here and it's in the bill and they're against it. They want to offer an amendment and explain why it shouldn't be in the bill. Offer an amendment to take it out. Sorry, we don't have time. Mr. President, I think this is a dangerous trend. Um, I believe we shouldn't be recessing today. I believe we should be working. We've got the fiscal cliff. We've got the defense sequester. We've got uh, tax increases monumentally about to occur. We've got the death tax going to 55% of any, virtually anything somebody has. All is going to happen if we don't take some action and all well, those people talking about secretly they're planning and talking and working. And so about Christmas Eve, I suspect they'll walk in here with a plan uh, that, that we're told we have to support or uh, else we'll work through Christmas or January 1st we'll be here and we'll have a catastrophe if all these bad things happen and the president won't even say what he's for. He won't even lay out a plan. Congressman Ryan's laid out a plan. He's defended it all over the country. He's prepared to discuss it and explain it. What's the president's plan? Senator Reid, what's your plan? Do you have any plan to confront our, our uh, uh, pension programs for Social Security and Medicare that are going broke? Do you have any plan to fix them? What is it? Isn't this important? Do you have any plan to get us off this trillion-dollar debt course? What are we going to do because the growth is going down? So I, uh, we were 2.4% in 2010. We had that much GDP growth, very slow recovery from the 2007-8 recession. But then did it go up in 2011? No, it dropped to 1.8. And what about the first three quarters of this year, 1.77? It's the, the growth is not occurring. We're borrowing and spending, but we're not creating growth. I think we need to 
deal with this crisis we face and the uncertainty of policy is hurting America's economy also. So I'm disappointed we're not dealing with these important issues. I'm disappointed we're recessing and we need to do better. I thank the chair and would yield the floor. Senator from Colorado is recognized. Mr. President, uh, listen with interest to my colleague from Alabama, and I have uh, great confidence that we will uh, have a robust debate on the National Defense Authorization Act over these next few weeks, and that uh, we will keep our record intact that now has been in place for some 50 years of putting in place a National Defense Authorization Act. We, we did so last year at this time. We did so, I think, the previous year. Uh, and uh, I have every confidence, again, I want to say that we'll have a, a, a comprehensive National Defense Authorization Act that will direct uh, the Pentagon and all the men and women in uniform who serve us so well as to the policies of the United States. I know I'll work with my colleague from Alabama to see that accomplished. Um, Mr. President, I come back to the uh, Senate floor today, as I have uh, on many occasions, to urge all of us to take action on a policy that's bipartisan uh, in its support and in its ramifications. And that policy is the production tax credit for wind energy. And we need to renew that production tax credit. Uh, why? Well, it's encouraged billions of dollars in investment, and it's helped create tens of thousands of good-paying American jobs all across our country. But I have to tell you, our inaction here uh, over these last months is truly jeopardizing the future of what's really a promising industry. Uh, we've literally over the last month seen uh, wind industry jobs in the thousands disappear. Uh, and that's not just a statistic, that's just not a statement. Those jobs have affected real Americans. And these job losses were completely preventable. <clears throat> and it's time for us to get back to work and extend the production tax credit so that our wind energy industry can also get back to work. And one of the things I've done, uh, Mr. President, I've come to the floor uh, some 20 plus times is, is focus on an individual state. And I want to uh, today uh, talk about a state that has incredible potential for wind power, and that's Montana, the last best place, as Montanans like to describe their amazing state. And like almost every state in the country, <clears throat> Montana's seen the jobs, clean energy, and economic benefits uh, of wind power. And I want to take uh, the viewers on a little bit of a tour of Montana. Um, the big sky country uh, is home to wind resources that could meet the state's current electricity needs 210 times over, which uh, if you compare that to uh, other states, Montana then has the third highest amount of wind resource potential in the country. And so it's, it's a prominent player uh, in the future progress of our nation's wind industry. And it's therefore no wonder <clears throat> that Montana has seen strong development in the wind energy sector. And if you look at uh, Toole County up here in the north, uh, northwest uh, court, uh, quarter of uh, Montana, uh, that's the site of a new wind farm, the Rimrock Wind Farm, uh, north of Cutbank. And it has 126 turbines, completed the project in September of this year. And what's most important is you, when you think about the jobs for local workers, and then the $2 million in tax revenue that's been generated, which contributes to the uh, $5.7 million in property taxes from wind farms across the state that all go to those local communities for schools, for roads, for social services, to enhance the quality of life of those Montanans. Uh, this, this wind farm, the Rimrock Wind Farm, will power thousands of Montana homes and as I've mentioned, along with the other wind farms across the state, it's provided great construction jobs uh, as the project was built. So Montana will continue to be an attractive state for wind development. But with the expiration of the PTC looming, literally uh, within about six weeks, Mr. President, the PTC will expire. The future growth of this important industry in Montana is in jeopardy. And we've seen just how important this industry is uh, to our energy and manufacturing future. And if it sidelined bipartisan wrangling here, that would be truly a tragedy. 
And I know like the presiding officer's state of New Mexico and my state of Colorado, the, the people of Montana know that we need an all of the above energy strategy to improve our overall energy security. And wind is playing a major role in that effort. <clears throat> and we know Montana's two senators, Senator Baucus and Senator Tester, are hardworking. Uh, they're very effective. And they've always supported the production tax credit for their state and for the country. Uh, and Senator Baucus himself, as the chairman of the Finance Committee, pushed forward a package uh, of bipartisan supported uh, tax extenders in early August that included the extension of the PTC. And it's just crucial that we take up this uh, package uh, as soon as we possibly can and pass it. Uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the work of Senator Baucus uh, and his focus on creating American jobs and securing true, uh, true energy security. But his work, our work isn't finished. We, we've got to get the PTC over the uh, finish line and affirm our solid commitment in this chamber to made in America energy and American manufacturing. And it's this simple, Mr. President. If we fail to extend the production tax credit, we are in effect shipping thousands of jobs overseas to places like China and Europe and our foreign competitors. So I come to the floor again to implore all of my colleagues to stop this possibility from becoming a reality. Uh, I want to reiterate it isn't a partisan issue. There's broad support uh, in this body for wind energy. There's also support uh, in the House. So this is a, there's bicameral support as well as bipartisan support. Um, we risk losing thousands of jobs and crippling a, an industry that's just now establishing itself as a very important part of our economic portfolio. I think the presiding officer would agree that we're sent here by the people of our states to make smart, informed decisions about the future on behalf of the American people. And if we let this uh, important tax credit, production tax credit, expire, it would be a decision we would all regret. I, I want to underline, too, that the tax credit is applied once that power is produced. Uh, this isn't a speculative subsidy. This isn't based on uh, hoping that uh, something will happen. It actually is based on power that's produced. Then that tax credit is directed to the utility of the power company, in some cases the community power uh, it, it, the agency that provides the power. So it's, it's based on actually producing those electrons through wind energy. So let's show America and the world that we are as committed to energy independence and job creation as we often say. Wind is key to that reaching that goal. Wind is the path to that goal. Let's put action behind our words and pass the production tax credit as soon as possible. It's as simple as Mr. President, the production tax credit equals jobs, so the PTC equals jobs. Let's pass it as soon as possible. Let's pass it ASAP. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I look forward to uh, sharing some perspectives on the great state of New Mexico uh, soon in the future, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, I yield the floor, and I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> Mr. Akaka. As the Senate continues in this quorum call, we're going to take you live to the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. This morning, they're releasing a report on the collapse of the financial firm MF Global. The firm, headed by former New Jersey Governor and Senator John Corzine, filed for bankruptcy on October 31, 2011. It was the eighth largest U.S. bankruptcy. Representative Randy Nagabauer chairs the subcommittee, and Representative Michael Capuano serves as the ranking Democrat. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. So that one regulator would be responsible when we had a failure like this. Uh, not several regulators all pointing their fingers at each other. Instead, Dodd-Frank eliminated one regulator, kept all the others, and added three more. And despite the promise of Dodd-Frank that regulators would work together, what the subcommittee investigation found is that there was no meaningful coordination among numerous federal regulators 
all responsible for a piece of uh, the pie and, uh, and who were responsible for the supervision. They, they were responsible for seeing that customer money was segregated and was not lost or, quote, misplaced. <laughs> and misplaced really minimizes. Uh, let me tell you, if your salary was misplaced for a year, I don't think you'd call it misplaced. Uh, federal regulators fail to share critical information about MF Global with one another, no coordination. Uh, this left each regulator with an incomplete understanding of the company's financial health, and MF Global's customers paid the price, not the regulators, uh, not MF Global. It was farmers, ranchers, and rural communities that suffered. Uh, when the regulators looked at each other, didn't know things, didn't coordinate. Uh, this once again raises the question, which we talked about two years ago, of whether regulators are so preoccupied writing hundreds of new rules that they're, basing, they're missing the basics like safeguarding customers' funds and protecting investors from financial fraud. You have more regulators than ever, but you have a, you have a historic failure. Uh, there are other fail, failings reported in this report, as well as recommendations on how to correct them, which uh, Chairman Nugenbauer will now review. Once again, I thank him and the staff for their outstanding work and our other members uh, on this legislation. And, uh, and I also appreciate uh, the media and the press uh, you cannot have a, a democracy without freedom of the press uh, and freedom of speech. And uh, you go to other countries where they don't have that. I, I just got back from a country where uh, that is very much in play. And so let us all celebrate that we live in a country where we do have freedom of press, freedom of speech. Well, thank you uh, as members of the press and media for being here. Well, good morning, uh, Congressman Randy Nagelbauer from Lubbock, Texas, and I'm um, the chairman of the Oversight Investigation Committee, and Chairman Backus uh, appointed me to that uh, at the beginning of this term, and uh, I appreciate uh, his leadership, I appreciate the contribution that uh, our fellow committee members have made, and uh, is, uh, uh, the chairman has mentioned that we've had a great staff effort on this. Uh, if you go back and look at our committee, we've held a number of hearings. We've investigated a lot of different issues. At the same time, we've been working on uh, this very important uh, report. And so our folks have put in a lot of extra hours to, to get us to this point. So the question is, is uh, you know, what is uh, this report? Well, this report is, a, is a basically a timeline uh, of the uh, uh, leading up to uh, MF Global's collapse, and I, I guess we could name this report the rise and fall uh, of MF Global. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, uh, we had three uh, subcommittee hearings where we, in fact, had uh, the senior executive officer of this company come, and uh, we had some of the regulators come. Uh, we've had interviewed over 50 witnesses, and as the chairman mentioned, we've uh, uh, looked at over 247,000 uh, pages uh, of documents. Uh, and so then the question is, then what was the purpose uh, of this study? Uh, well, basically it was to give us a, a history of what happened so that we can look in the future to make sure that this doesn't happen again. As uh, was mentioned, this is the first time uh, in the history of the industry that the customer's money uh, went missing. And I think that's the important part of what, what this study and the purpose of the study was to find out why customer's money well, went missing. Secondly, were there regulatory uh, failures uh, that contributed to this or allowed this to happen? Uh, because you know, one of the things we put regulators in place to do is to ensure that uh, that the laws are enforced and that, that markets are uh, transparent. Uh, and so we wanted to look at that. And thirdly, to look at then uh, what we could do in the future to make sure that this kind of event uh, doesn't happen. Uh, and so the question is then, uh, uh, you know, the, we, the customer's money missing is inexcusable, but also I think one of the things that the, the chairman alluded to is that in the past, you know, whenever we have a failure like this, there is this urge for more regulation. 
Uh, I think in many cases what we've seen is we didn't need more regulation. In some cases we needed regulators actually uh, doing, doing their job. Uh, and so, uh, when, so what did we find? Uh, well, we found that uh, John Corzine contributed greatly uh, to the demise uh, of this company. This company was already struggling somewhat. They'd had some uh, uh, problems with uh, internal controls, a rogue trader. They brought Mr. Corzine in. Mr. Corzine was charged with trying to, trying to turn this com company around, move it to more, more profitable. He decided that the way to do that was to try to make it a mini Goldman Sachs. Uh, and unfortunately, that plan did not pan out for the company. And almost 17 months later, after Mr. Corzine took office, this company failed. There was breakdown in communications between the reg in the regulatory community. Uh, we, we saw that where the CFTC and the SEC were not talking to each other, uh, there was some course uh, actions being taken that weren't shared with some of the other regulators. Uh, and is even the coordination really uh, and if you can call it coordination, communication really didn't start taking place in really until the last hours and days uh, of the life of MF Global. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we need for our markets to be is open and transparent, and companies have, I think, a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that they are providing accurate information to investors and lenders and market participants out there. Uh, we feel like that uh, MF Global was not necessarily always straightforward um, with the condition of the company, uh, the positions that they've taken on, uh, and so we think that uh, this is, uh, was one of the, the, the fallacies as well. Uh, act additionally, uh, some of the issues that were important to this is that the rating agencies, uh, we feel like, uh, didn't fail to recognize early on that this company had taken on a higher risk profile. Uh, in fact, they were told up front when Mr. Corzine took uh, over MF Global that, that they were going to take a more aggressive stance. And in fact, people reported that uh, they would uh, actually have to increase their risk profile to do that. But in yet, uh, we didn't see the rating agencies monitor that as, uh, through the process. One of the things uh, that we, we found kind of interesting was that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank in uh, New York uh, gave uh, this company a primary dealer status. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that in the marketplace is perceived that primary dealer status is kind of a good housekeeping and seal of approval. But yet this was a company that was struggling with earnings uh, and had other issues and histories of, of, of internal control problems, uh, and yet the Fed decided to, uh, you know, uh, give, grant them this status. Uh, the other, other the, some of the accounting methods that were being used were uh, the alternative method, uh, where some of the people that were trading on some of the foreign markets, uh, MF Global was able to access some of those customer money, use that uh, customer money. In fact, uh, I think somebody referred to it as they were using it as, as an ATM. Uh, we find we find that particularly troubling as well. And then I think the, one of the things that's going on right now, as you know, and a, a good portion of some of the funds is, is, is in the UK right now. Uh, and that uh, money is subject to lit litigation and how much of that money would be available to, for return to investors uh, is, is still uh, up in the air. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we think that, that down the road, uh, you know, we're going to have to look at some better harmonization uh, on how, when, where we have customers trading in foreign markets and making sure that they have the same protections that uh, people that are trading uh, in the U.S. have as well. And, and so, uh, you know, where do we go from here? Because I think that's what everybody wants to say, okay, now we have a report. I think we have a great chronology of what happened. I think we have some findings. You know, not everybody, quite honestly, is going to agree with this report. Uh, and, and it probably depends on, you know, what end of this report you're on. Uh, but what we did design this report to do uh, is to, to begin a discussion, uh, a very important discussion, so that we can ensure in the future that we don't have customers' money go missing. We went uh, many years, uh, you know, uh, without customers losing their money, and then within a year we had two instances where customers lost their money. And so uh, one was plenty and two is enough. And so we want to move forward with that. So this, this, this document will provide a discussion for that about the regulatory structure, as the chairman mentioned, is uh, that we have a lot of duplication in this. And we had uh, regulators that were regulating one piece of the business, 
uh, and they were really focusing only on their part of the business, really not realizing they should realize that that could impact the other side of the business where the other regulator probably would need to monitor it from that side. So then the question is, is do we need some streamlining or do we need some consolidation uh, in the regulatory structure? You know, making sure that uh, we, uh, uh, the disclosures uh, that are being made by companies, that the companies are, are following the law. We, we feel like that uh, the SEC needs to investigate whether the company was forthright with their disclosures about their financial position through this process, not only disclosing the, uh, the RTMs, uh, but also some of the disclosures that they made in the last weeks and, and months uh, of the company. Uh, obviously, the credit rating agencies were, are mentioned in this report. Uh, you know, we, we need to think that uh, we need a robust uh, industry there, but what we also need know is that uh, they really, they, while they were, this company was uh, rated at uh, investment grade, just, a, just at investment grade, uh, they really failed to recognize the uh, significance of the positions they taken really until the very end when basically uh, it, it was too late. Uh, so one of the things that we hope then from gleaning from this report is we begin to, to, to get feedback. Uh, it's going to be important for all of the stakeholders, and there's already a number of stakeholders out there that have some potential solutions uh, to how we prevent this from happening in the future. We welcome those. Uh, there is no legislation or recommendation in this report at this particular time because basically the purpose was to begin the discussion. So many times the government wants to run out, as I said earlier, and, and pass new leg regulations. Uh, when we first we need to find out what happened, why it happened, uh, also give the industry an opportunity to bring forth what they think are solutions, but more importantly at the end game here will be to have uh, to make whatever necessary changes to make sure customers don't lose their money, that these markets are fair and transparent, and, and third, that we have a regulatory community that's structured uh, for the 21st century uh, securities markets. These markets have become very complex. Uh, and they require very robust uh, regulators uh, and state-of-the-art regulators. Uh, and if the current structure isn't working appropriately, then we need to take a look at that. So with that, uh, kind of outlined the ports available here, and we would uh, be glad to take uh, some questions. And uh, would you, Lane, Lane, would you? Everybody. Sure. Uh, first, uh, great kudos to uh, Chairman uh, Neugebauer and his staff who are absolutely outstanding and, and dedicated uh, and smart, wise public servants and they have put together uh, a remarkable uh, forensic document in a sense. Uh, the job of government is to provide an environment in which our citizens can live their lives uh, knowing that uh, they will not be uh, subject to uh, nefarious actions by others. Uh, in the case of uh, the, the farmers and ranchers, uh, the, uh, the, the terrible stories, thousands of stories like this that, that Chairman Bach has described, uh, there was a failure of government to uh, protect these people. Uh, and the results of this investigation, fulfilling Congress's obligation to provide oversight, uh, tell us that we have many opportunities to improve uh, and provide better protection. And uh, these opportunities run the gamut from uh, following the behavior of uh, those who are in charge uh, at uh, entities like MF Global uh, to uh, monitoring the, uh, and modifying the ways in which uh, the ratings agencies do their business, uh, do their job. And uh, there have been so many failures uh, in, in so many ways, not only in MF Global, but in other uh, similar uh, stories uh, in recent history. Uh, and one common strand seems to be that we need to provide our regulators with better tools uh, to pursue uh, the enforcement of laws that existed prior to the massive imposition of Dodd-Frank. We do not have infinite resources in the United States, uh, nor in our financial uh, marketplace. We do not have infinite resources to pursue every um, aspect of uh, what uh, 
regulators might want to pursue in Dodd-Frank, but they do desperately need to be able to dedicate resources to better following the nature of transactions in this rapidly evolving marketplace and to understanding how they can curb the excesses of uh, human nature in the case of Mr. Corzine uh, by, by more effective monitoring, uh, more transparency, uh, and, and more coordination and uh, consolidation so that we can really have uh, effective, lean, streamlined uh, regulatory uh, structure that will consume the right amount of resources, not too much, allow opportunity, allow commerce and business to thrive, and protect those who are most vulnerable. Thank you again, Chairman, and Chairman Bacchus for your leadership over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would first of all like to thank uh, Chairman Spencer Bacchus for his leadership on the committee and also uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Chairman, Subcommittee Chairman uh, Randy Nagabauer for his work on this report and on the subcommittee. One of the things that I came away with uh, representing a district that has an enormous amount of agriculture ranging from San Antonio, Texas all the way to El Paso, Texas, is the idea that um, uh, farmers and ranchers, uh, food producers, uh, their funds uh, that guarantee that they can stay in business of raising their crops and raising their livestock uh, were not secure the way they should have been secure. Yet what we had, as uh, Chairman uh, Nagbauer said, we had agencies that had all the power in the world to go out there and regulate uh, MF Global and refused to do so simply because of the aura of a previous politician that came into um, this, uh, this business and really did not show uh, any kind of uh, knowledge or ability to guide a company like MF Global that was a quasi-utility uh, for uh, the farmers and ranchers and to assure them that their funds would be guaranteed so that they could uh, stay another season or another planting season, uh, but gave them a free pass and gave them more and more uh, authority over customers' money. Uh, I'm glad that this report uh, points out all of those defects because we need to start focusing on what is really wrong and, and be not afraid of what it is that we discover in how our uh, regulatory agencies function for the well-being of our economy, for the well-being of uh, our industries, and for the well-being of all of our citizens. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, I encourage all of you to take a copy of this report, and um, hopefully it will yield good legislation in the next Congress. Thank you. Uh, just haven't had a chance to read every line or footnote, but uh, one of the central critical questions in all this was Corzine's role during the failure of the firm. Did you find any evidence that Corzine in fact personally ordered or directed uh, the transfer of customer segregated funds? Well, what we do know is there was a, a memo that said that to authorize to transfer some funds and it was the wire transfer I think was to cover the overdraft uh, at J.P. Morgan it, and, it, and I think it was, per, it was said per uh, Mr. Corzine. Uh, what we did learn about this company is that this company had terrible record keeping uh, poor internal controls, and Mr. Corazon really managed uh, the process of, you know, uh, isolating what would be normal risk management internal controls and basically uh, using his position to, uh, uh, you know, basically ignore that. Uh, so we're, we're, we're some, somewhat in the disarray there, and of course, in the fi if you read the, the report in the final days, uh, you know, it was a mess over there. They were, they were literally doing things on Excel spreadsheets to try to figure out where they were. But, but did anybody that you talked to, or is there any evidence that, you know, Corzine picked up the phone and told, you know, Edith O'Brien to do this? Is there anything? Uh, let like, me, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. You know, if it, uh, you wake up one morning and uh, there's snow on the ground, and uh, you look out your window, and there are rabbit tracks, uh, you may not see the rabbit, 
but the tracks are a pretty strong indication that uh, a rabbit has crossed the lawn during the night. And uh, yes, there's circumstantial evidence that either John Corzon uh, either directed it or knew about it. Uh, the idea that he was oblivious to this is uh, certainly uh, like the rabbit tracks is a pretty good indication. Uh, so whether the courts will find any criminal intent, not for me uh, to say. Uh, you know, I think Mann and Kiko both made two important points. One is, is uh, uh, Congresswoman Hayworth said, uh, you had all these regulators uh, and they were not cooperating. Uh, one was saying, well, that's not my part, that's not mine. One of the farmers that wrote a letter to me said, look, I'm tired of hearing from the CFTC that this is an SEC thing. I'm tired of hearing that this is somebody else's part of the pie. All I know is my money's missing. And uh, these regulators in the last two years have written under Dodd-Frank over 400 new rules. They've added, there's three new regulators and there are 7,000 pages of new regulations but the one regulation, the most important regulation, is don't take customer money. Don't take money that doesn't belong to you and trade with it or use it. It's been on the books forever. And that's the only regulation we needed. Let me say this. Capitalism cannot function without a moral and ethical basis. Uh, and. I can tell you that ethically and morally what went on here was wrong. And one reason that we need to investigate this is this undermines people's trust in capitalism and our free market. And behavior like this, uh, it, it violates the trust that, that uh, we have and the American people have in our government. Um, the one thing we ask the government to do is protect us against wrongdoing. Now, uh, as Kiko said, I represent these people. This money was not in an account, that, a joint account with John Corzon. It was, it was a separate account. It wasn't a joint account. And it was as if someone took your pension money and went to Las Vegas and gambled it away. That would be wrong. And that's what happened here. It wasn't MF Global's money. They had no right to use it. Had they used it and had they made a profit on it, these farmers and ranchers would not have seen that profit. It was only when they lost it. And you know, Kiko said something, if, if you missed everything else, he said this guy had the aurora, he had the reputation as a former senator. He was politically well connected. Well, let me give you some evidence of that. When the CFT, CFTC chairman was asked to come and investigate this and take charge, he said, I can't do that because we were friends on Wall Street. And I'm going to have to recuse myself. Well, <laughs> should we have someone that cannot, that is a friend of someone's and can't get involved in it or doesn't feel like he can be fair and impartial uh, in that position? Uh, yeah, I was actually shocked when he said that. Well, doesn't he know he came from Wall Street? Doesn't he know everybody on Wall Street? 
I mean, aren't there four or five companies that do 80 percent of the business on Wall Street? And if people are here from those firms, they ought not, their friends ought to be the American people, customers, not the folks on Wall Street that they, and we have that situation where people come from there and they go to there. And uh, so that, that to me raised a red flag. I wonder if you could talk about your participation with the Democrats on doing this report and why some of them hadn't signed off on our group. And also, Chairman Backer, can you explain on what you said at the beginning about FHA? Confirm what's the number six to twelve billion. Well, actually, I, I, I aired in that remark. It'll be several billion dollars. So, you know, this uh, I think in their 60-year history, uh, you know, this is the first time that uh, they've totally run out of money. They have about six hundred million dollars, as I understand, uh, in that they're they're burning through. And uh, within a month, because of the number of foreclosures, uh, they will, they've indicated they will have to come to the American people and, a and ask for money. Um, and um, you know, we will, we can get you those numbers. Now, we actually, in a hearing this spring, uh, we we uh, asked FHA. We said it appears to us that you're going to become insolvent within a matter of months. So this was no surprise, and, and they said that they did not believe that was the case. Uh, of course, you know, Fannie and Freddie, we found out <laughs> within a month uh, that, as opposed to being not a problem, that they were bankrupt. And that's why this government doesn't need to, to operate in a, a circumstance that uh, uh, when we hit a, a downturn, uh, things totally fall apart. That, that's why you. That's why government should be like people. There should be a reserve. There should be. A, there should be money for a rainy day. And as you know, since 2008, we've been in somewhat of a monsoon. I think the other question was uh, about the, the minority being included. Yes, every document that we've got, uh, every. Uh, I mean, they, they they were able to uh, have access to that. Uh, we uh, sent them a draft, I think, about a month ago, uh, and they sent some feedback. And uh, I know that uh, I think uh, uh, Ranking Member Capiano said yesterday that they may have some additional comments, and we, we welcome those. Uh, as I said, this, the purpose of this uh, document was to generate discussion, and uh, if they've got some more things to, to add to this, we welcome their input. Yes. Well, I don't think we, we uh, as I said, I think what we said in this report is that the regulatory structure has got a lot of overlap. There's a lot of people that are regulating this environment, and uh, we, what we, uh, you know, feel like that not everybody's talking to each other. Uh, where we, the point forward is this: is uh, obviously this report is going to generate a lot of discussion. There are going to be people that will be disagree with some of the, the the chronology. Some people will disagree with some of the findings. Uh, what we would hope is that as those solutions, because everybody recognizes that the fact that the mo the money went missing, uh, and that that's a that's, that's a flaw, and we need to fix that. And so the, as these solutions come forward, uh, some of them may not require Congress to act on them. The industry itself may you know take appropriate action. Some of them may require require that we, that, that we need enabling a legislation for that solution. If they do, we'll, we'll bring that forward. Yes, sir. You talked a lot about how you think the answer is not more regulations, but maybe you know, enforcing existing rules better. The CFTC has proposed several rules in the last several weeks coming off the MFG scandal and also the heritage. Do you think that was a mistake? Do you think they're taking the wrong road on this? Or do you think well, I think I think one of the things that they came forward, you know, and said, uh, number one, don't use the alternative method. We we, we think that's a that's, we, I think that's a, a good thing on their behalf. Uh, what we do hope is the regulatory community is doing a self-examination 
uh, of uh, you know this process as well. We, we hope this report will maybe uh, provide some additional information that. But th they should be doing that because and, and our job is oversight is to make sure that that is what they're doing. And if they can do it with rulemaking, uh, that 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 would be appropriate. One of the things that we do want them to do, though, is if they begin the rulemaking process, is to make sure that they're doing a cost-benefit analysis. In other words, I said this only happened once. Once is too much. Then it happened again. But what we don't want to do uh, is make these markets uh, uh, unaccessible or, or inefficient for the market participants because we all overreacted, uh, you know, to, to this occurrence. I think we've identified where the pitfalls are. Now we just need to take uh, the, 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 the steps only necessary to fill the gaps and not try to do like we did in Dodd Frank, and that is throw a big blanket over over the over everything. Sir, have you, have you referred the, your report and findings to the Justice Department? Uh, and we, will be, we will be distributing uh, this to uh, all the relevant agencies. I think some, some, some have been given an advanced copy, but uh, everybody will have it. It's on the website. We, 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 we know a lot of the market participants. We hope that some of the, the, the people that are using these will go and look at the report as well. But is there a formal process of, of re referring these uh, findings to the Justice Department or not? Which no, they're, they're welcome to look at it like anybody else. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, we're, uh, based on the findings, though, in this, in this dereliction of duty, personally, do you, how do you feel about, uh, about Mr. Corzine's culpability? Do you think that he should be charged civilly, criminally, based on what you've learned? Well, what we what we saw was was uh, you know mismanagement at it, it, its highest, I believe. Uh, Mr. Corzine, you know, I don't think understood the, the business that he had taken over as CEO. Uh, he was trying to transform it into something that it had not been in the past, uh, and he was. Uh, you know, t when people disagreed with him, he found other positions for him. He brought people in that he felt like he could control, and his COO, or his chief, uh, uh, chief operating officer, I think, was his former chief of staff. And so, basically, he was micromanaging this company. He was also chairman of the board, and and so where you would have had some normally some uh, corporate governance from from the board, uh, the board, uh, you know, uh, pretty much gave uh, Mr. Corzine, you know, carte blanche to do pretty much what what he wanted to do. Uh, so, like, I think the question was. Whether it's criminal act or just negligence or, or just you know, you know, poor management skills, uh, that's for somebody else to determine. But uh, obviously, as we say in the report, we're pretty clear about that. That we feel like uh, John Corzine was the primary culprit uh, for the demise of, of MF Global. Yes. Sorry, my, my uh, second question was about the um, why the report didn't criticize the software in general. Well, you know, I think in the chronology at this particular point in time, we, we uh, like you said, there, some of the agencies are, uh, have their own investigation going on. We didn't have access to all of the records, and so we don't know uh, where, where uh, the CFTC and, and all uh, they are in their recommendations and, and their findings. Uh, we hope, hopefully, at some point in time, they, they, they release their findings as well. Uh, we weren't on a witch hunt here. We were on a fact hunt. Uh, and we feel like that we presented fairly the facts and the chronology of what happened and a little bit of, of why it happened. And hopefully, as I said, this becomes a discussion uh, uh, document uh, to, to move forward. Yes, sir. Chairman Bob has noted, and you know, what a kind of blow to conscience of farmers and ranchers that this event was. You know, after completing the report, do you think that these market users should be more confident or less confident going forward using these markets? Well, I, th I think I think what we what we're hearing is that there's been uh, I've talked to some of the people in the industry and it's definitely had an impact. Uh, people have moved uh, their businesses. I think they're you know they're taking a closer look at who 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 they're doing business with and the counterparties uh, and, and all of the st the structure of that. Uh, what we w don't want to do though is is have the government kind of moving that business around. We want to give uh, the, the customers, the farmers and ranchers, and people that use those important risk management tools the confidence that whoever they're doing business with uh, is you know. Uh, uh, being overseen uh, and that, that there are rules in place to, to protect their money. He was enough of an outlier that they should have confidence that they can go forward with other companies that do that, or should they be worried that there could be others? You know, like, I mean, Eric, it was more like a theft, I believe. But, yeah. Chairman may want to Chris. I think that's a very good question, and probably at, at the essence of, uh, of one reason for this investigation. 
uh, and one of the findings was this farmer that uh, I mentioned from Texas, a 74-year-old with Parkinson's, he said, I consider myself an informed uh, investor. And he said, I was looking, EMF Global was ranked very high. I had no indication. I read, I read, I checked up. I would not have put my money with the firm had there been any warning whatsoever. Uh, so your question is a question I think all Americans ought to ask. When I put my money in an institution or I do business with a financial concern, how do I know that I'm being protected? Um, you remember Madoff? There was a broker dealer and there was a financial advisor. He had two different operations. And a lot of people said, when they, where's my money? Well, it was in a financial advisor. It wasn't in the broker dealer. They said, what, what does, what's the difference? My money's gone. What do you mean you're not in charge? of the financial advisor, you know, you're the SEC, you're in charge of the broker-dealer, you know, or, or FINRA. And we created more regulators, we created more regulation. The, the, the fastest-growing profession in America is federal financial regulators. The Bureau, and that's not some Republican talking point. In March, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out and said, the fastest growing uh, occupation is financial regulators, 27 percent, a lot of new jobs. Uh, all these agencies are hiring. They're hiring hundreds and hundreds of new employees. But the, the rules that have been on the books to prevent what Madoff did or what MF Capital did, you didn't need a, a Dodd-Frank for that. Dodd-Frank was supposed to end that, but it's complicated. It's add new regulators, and the American people, you know, this ought to be a wake-up call to us that it's enforcing the laws, not just creating laws upon laws and layers upon layers. I'm told by the staff we got time for one more question. I'll let that be you. Um, it has been over a year at this point. Are you surprised you haven't seen any action taken by the CFTC at this point in terms of cases or charges against anybody or anything? I'm sorry, I'm having a tough time of hearing you. It has been more than a year at this point. Are you surprised you haven't seen any action taken by the CFTC against any MF Global former executives? Well, I think what you can realize is, is that there's a lot of uh, documents that have been generated from this transaction and trying to learn what everybody knew was, has been a, a difficult process for us. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm told that there are a number of investigations still underway, uh, CFTC, SEC, uh, and my guess is uh, fairly shortly we're going to begin to, to hear from that. But uh, there was a lot of transactions. This was a very complex uh, company, had a lot of different affiliates, uh, had a lot of different operations. It was, it was a global company. Uh, and and so I think you know what everybody wants to make sure of is if they move forward with uh, an action uh, that they have the, the proof and the, and the documentation that they need to do that. I thank everybody for coming today, and uh, again appreciate your uh, interest in this. If staff is some of the staff committee staff that work so hard on this report will be around. Uh, if you have more detailed uh, questions about that, they would be happy to do that. And thank you, and have a good day. I appreciate y'all's attendance and uh, your interest.
mr. president?